And in cases like this where we've got ab fraction, okay, ab fraction defects, you really ought not to graft these defects because the patient has an underlying occlusal problem. Okay, so what you want to do in this type of a person, I would really want to be having a look at their, you know, occlusion, stabilizing the occlusion, not me, but, uh, you know, this is, a, um, this is the practitioner's sort of perspective. So in these cases, I would be very wary about doing um, elective grafting just to, just to correct the gingival um, recession. So... There was this, a lot of people think that, you know, brushing um, their teeth too hard is linked to gingival recession. And there was this study which was done in 2003, which actually said that um, traumatic brushing can contribute, but is not the only cause. The causes of gingival recession, as we know, are multifactorial. As with all types of periodontal diseases, they are multifactorial. So the, the only cause is not um, brushing. And I, what I see a lot from some patients are, are, you know, oh, I've been advised to take a softer toothbrush. And what ends up is they end up having lots of plaque at their gingival margins, and they get an increase of recession from an inflammatory perspective. So... Um, I think you need to be quite cautious in sort of like advising patients on how to brush around recession defects. Usually I'd say modify their tooth pet, toothbrush, get them to brush, you know, whilst they look at what they're doing. A lot of patients don't do that. If any of you are interested in any re references, um, these would be good ones to look at. Um, if you guys want to get really bored. Um, no, actually, it's a really exciting textbook but by Marcus Herzler, and it's, it's like the Bible of soft tissues, about this big and bright pink. Um, so if you guys want to read it, you can come and borrow it from me. I wouldn't advise that you buy one. It's like about $500 or something. So if you want to look at it, it's a great textbook. Um, there were some other studies, which I'm actually just going to... Um, flick through, um, which were, this was done on, um, this was a systematic review, and I think you're all pretty clear about what systematic reviews are, yeah? So they ask a focus question, and with that focus question, then they review the literature, usually do that via PubMed search, first of all, and then they set, set down selection criteria as what they want to include within their literature search, and then they collect all the, the studies which closely fit their um, selection criteria. And in that way, what they can do, one of the problems with, with dental studies and medical studies is the fact that you have to recruit patients for it. And whenever you recruit patients, the numbers really drop. So the idea is that they combine all of these smaller studies into a bigger study, which is comparable, so they can try and get some sort of power out of it. And what they found was, um, of course, that there are a variety of techniques which are involved within the literature. But what they did find was the connective tissue graft had the best results as far as root coverage is concerned, with a mean coverage of greater than 90%. That's what P.D. Miller's work showed, and that was supported by this, um, by this literature review as well. So this is the sort of grafting. I'm really sorry. Some of these, these pictures are really old. They were before, you know, I would be nice and taking really good pictures, but the pictures will improve, I promise you. So these are the ones that I did at the Royal London. And you can see here that, you know, it's um, very difficult for her to, to, um, to maintain good oral hygiene, and that we used a free gingival graft on this lady. And you can see that the amount of root coverage that we got was around about 50%. So it was not brilliant, but to actually improve her cleaning, it actually um, did really well. The reason why you know that it's um, a free gingival graft is gingiva actually remembers where it comes from, so it always still looks like the roof of the mouth. The donor site that you get is usually, um, the donor site that I use is usually the um, 6543 region. I don't go any further than that, but you can see how the color of gingiva is much whiter 
So gingiva will always remember where it was. Okay, when you put, take gingiva from one area and you put it to another area, it will always look exactly like this. Okay, and I'll show you some more examples of that. And so for an aesthetic area, you would opt not to do a free gingival graft. You would think of doing something like a connective tissue graft. Connective tissue grafts, subepithelial grafts, on the other hand, they don't remember what they came, where they came from. They actually um, incorporate the color of the surrounding tissues. Okay, so they do a lot better as far as aesthetics is concerned. Whenever you're doing these types of of um, procedures, you can see here this, um, the artery and the greater palatine artery and all the vessels. Um, if you're going to start doing these types of procedures, you have only a small window of area that you can actually take um, tissue from. And when you take tissue from this area, if you do prang one of these vessels, then you have to know how to deal with it. Has this ever happened to me? Absolutely, it has happened to me. Have I been able to deal with it? Sure, you know, because I can ligate these vessels without really an issue um, with deep sutures. So um, if you do, and, and maybe you're praying these vessels for another reason, but if you do that, then a really nice technique of, of stopping bleeding in the palate is to take the other side of your mirror yeah, so the, the, the blunt side, not the one with the mirror on it, um, to position it in the area that you think the bleed's coming for and to put a lot of pressure onto that area. If, that, if it stops bleeding from that area, take a nice suture. Um, so you want to use a 4-0. You don't want to use a 3-0 because you're not going to be able to, to get the suture from one side to the other and you need to actually do quite a, a strong mattress suture into this area and that will stop the bleeding along with some local anaesthetic. It will ligate the area quite nicely. Um, other people also put like Surgicel or Gelatamp or something like that in there. I don't find that I need to. A lot of people make like, um, like small dentures, um, plates to to put on, on the palate um, to stop the bleeding post-operatively. Um, look, I've done that about five times ever, and I found that every single one of those patients wore them for like a day. And since they have to pay like about $200 for it, I just think it's a bit of a waste of money. I don't have generally have a, a problem with um, bleeding from the palate. Um, this is the type of, of um, incision that um, we used to do as far as um, Taking the graft is concerned, so this is subepithelial graft. Um, in this case, um, this is the one and only trap door. You can see why it's called a trap door. I'd, I've only used this technique once, um, and I took a picture of it. Um, it tends to heal quite poorly because you've got three incision lines, and these sort of um, vertical incisions, they never sort of go back together very well. Um, but the night, this, this is a slick, split thickness flap that you use. Um, you see, it's a little bit messy when it goes back. I don't use this technique anymore. I use this technique all the time, which is a single cut. It's a little bit more technically um, demanding, um, but you can see that the actual, um, if you look back at this, uh, look back at this one, like this one, you have to put sutures into this area. Um, in this one, I, some, I, don't, I don't even use sutures most of the time for these types of cases because what happens is that the blood forms a really nice glue and just glues all of this back up together. Um, in this case, I did put a little couple of sutures there, but you can put some cross sutures across it if you want. All depends on how much the patient is bleeding and what, how much hemostasis you need. So this is immediately post-surgery. And in general, you can get soft tissue graft wise from one side in the palate which is one side of the palate you can generally take enough soft tissue for about two teeth so you can't take an awful lot with um, multiple cases you have to do multiple surgeries this is a reasonably generous flap as well. If you just go back here, you can see that the incision starts about two millimeters from the pre-gingival margin. If you go any closer there, you're going to cause some recession. 
If you go too far into these rugi, then this old button holes. And you want to go around about eight millimeters in depth because any deeper than that, you're going to prang a blood vessel. So these are all the things that you need to actually be thinking of when you're, when you're dealing with um, the palate. Um, so this um, Japanese group looked at how do soft tissue grafts heal. And the healing of soft tissue grafts is very predictable. Okay? It, the first part, which is in the zero to, I usually tell the patients, zero to four days, the graft will not have its own blood supply. So basically, it is going to rely on diffusion from the outside areas to actually get its own blood supply. In that circumstance, you need to make sure that how you fix the graft is very, very specific and the instructions you give to the patient as well. In the, the following days, the graft starts to revascularize. So basically, the little, the little um, capillaries join onto the surrounding capillaries in the, um, in the recipient bed, and they actually start to give it its own blood supply. Okay, that is a really nice time for us as clinicians because we know that what our treatment is working. Really bad for the patients because it always looks like the dog's been at it. So it looks terrible. I had a, a patient once who, who um, I did a soft tissue graft on um, for one of Bob Hatinsky's patients. Thankfully, it was Bob's patient. And, um, and the patient's mum was a nurse. So I said to the patient, don't look at the graft for the first week because it's going to scare you. You know, all of these changes are going to happen and you're going to get scared. So don't look at it. So, of course, the patient listened to me and looked at it. Yeah. And not only did they look at it, but they got really scared and then showed it to her mother-in-law who said, oh, that doesn't look right. No. Oh, you better go back to the doctor with that. Yeah, that looks all infected and horrid. Yeah? And so thankfully, he went to see Bob because he was a lot closer to Bob than what I was to me and Subieko, and it looked absolutely normal. It looked purple, it looked enlarged, it looked like red, it looked like the epithelium was sloughing off it. All of these things are good things because it means that the graft is getting its own blood supply. The worst thing that you can see with a, with a, with a connective tissue graft over the next week is it, for it to look white or gray <laughs> and flat, yeah? If I ever see these, I get really disappointed because I know that something's gone wrong, yeah? Thankfully, I don't see them that often. Um, the maturation phase, one of the beautiful things about autogenous grafts is that where you take the grafted tissue takes about eight weeks to regenerate, yeah? So you can take the tissue eight weeks later and do another connective tissue graft for the patient, yeah? So you have this endless regenerating supply in the palate. And usually when you take the soft tissue the second time, you have better quality soft tissue with fewer fat cells and with nicer arrangement of cells. And you end up with even better results with the second lot of connective tissue that you take. So there, are, there is this interesting case report which was done in 2001 of this chap, and I'm sure this, the, the patient was actually, it's a case report, um, but it's the only histological case report that we have of a, of a um, tooth which has had some gingival grafting done, and then it's been extracted, and then looked at under histology. It must be a family member of this chap, Goldstein. Yeah, it might be like his daughter or something, you know, a son. So what happened was, this, um, the upper premolars needed extracting, they had, for orthodontic purposes. They had some recession on her, them. So what this chap did was on one side, he didn't repair the recession. On the other side, he repaired the recession. So he had like a split mouth study there. And then he extracted the tooth along with the, um, with a section of the soft tissue. And what he found that after the, the, um, the connective tissue graft, this was his histology, um, three months afterwards, he had got new bone formation and also new cementum fo formation and the junctional epithelium just um, attaching to the tooth. If you speak to somebody like Reno Burkhart, who is like the, the guru of microsurgery and um, connective tissue and gingival grafting, um, the majority of gingival grafts actually heal with a long junctional epithelium, hemidesmosomal attachment to the root surface. 
Okay, so we're not, it's an epithelial attachment. We're not expecting this because unfortunately this study in humans can't be recreated, but it would be nice to imagine that, you know, you are recreating bone and cementum. But I, I don't think, I just thought it was an interesting study. Um, this was another study that was done by Burkhardt who looked at the types of instruments that you use. In my surgery, we use, we use for soft tissue grafting, we use microsurgical instruments. And the studies that have been done on conventional surgical instruments versus microsurgical instruments, um, especially by this, this guy, um, found that you had increased vascularization and percentage root recovery which when you change the types of instruments that you use. So you didn't use something like these to place your sutures and do make your incisions. So the factors that influence what sort of root coverage you would get will be the lateral dimensions of the um, of the defect. So not only the classification, which is class one, two, or three, but also the dimension. So the width of the defect. If you have a very wide defect, then, and this wideness is greater than three millimeters, then what happens is your likelihood of complete root coverage is lower. Why? Because the, amount, the area where the cells need to grow in is going to be less even when you use coronally advanced flaps. Um, the amount of attached gingiva, always easier to, to, to repair a session when you have more attached gingiva. Um, if, you have, if the patient has poor oral hygiene, then the likelihood of your graft actually being successful is, is reduced. Smoking status, I think this in itself is the single most important um, factor. Um, I don't do gingival grafting in patients who smoke because it just doesn't make sense, you know? The biology, you're not respecting the biology. You're, you're actually expecting something to revascularize from a, um, from a sort of diffusion perspective in a case where somebody is a smoker and we know what does smoking do to the... Um, to the nicot nicotinic receptors within the body. It actually causes them to, to constrict. Yeah? So it decreases the plasmatic circulation around the gingiva. So of course, you got, you're already hampering your results from the start and your predictability of treatment and the amount of money that the patient's gonna spend. So usually, you know, not usually, I, I did one case and yeah, my, my numbers, yeah, are very low, but it failed in a patient who, who smoked. So um, I only do these types of grafting procedures in patients who smoke. I uh, not I uh, don't smoke. Sorry, sorry. Um, um, so connective tissue grafting. So this type of a, of a situation would be a class one situation, you can see, but it's actually quite a wide defect, which is here. Always around canines, you tend to get wide defects. But, sorry again, these are a little bit blurry there, but we can see that we almost get 100% root coverage here, and we did in the premolars. Premolars tend to respond very well to, to connective tissue grafting. Um, this, is, this type of a situation where you've got multiple recession defects, um, and you can see that this person had, this wasn't done by me, but you, can you see the difference here? This is a connect, uh, free gingival graft. You know, why? Because gingiva always remembers what it was, you know? It always remembers that it had, it came from the palate and it remembers that it will stay like that for the rest of the patient's life. So this was the patient after I'd done a couple of um, connective tissue grafts. And you can see the difference in color between the connective tissue graft. It's actually taking on the, the color of the surrounding tissue. It's not actually having this whitened color. And it took a few goes. So this is a, a, the sort of situation which you should expect at about a week's time. You can see it looks like the dog's been at it, yeah? But when I see this, I'm so happy, you know? Because I can see all of these little blood vessels and it looks so nice to me, you know? Because, <laughs> like I'm a periodontist, okay? So, but this looks so lovely to me because I just know that this is gonna be a great success. So. Um, this was the patient after the area had healed. So we had really nice 
improvement in the root coverage. With these types of residual areas of, of um, 